So as we turn to general discussion, I wanted to pick back up on Marcelo's uh, excellent point. I thought about the, the half-life of some of these interventions that we've been, dis been discussing. Seven, you, you showed uh, one graph that, that they endure a week later, but I'm, I'm wondering how long after that. Um, but I also wanted to make another point. And so that would be, I would want to hear your thoughts on that. But my question or perhaps a statement is for us to think about how we can build a bridge between um, these interventions, if they're short term, and the longer term enterprise of building character and building habits of truth seeking and thinking um, more um, an Aristotelian approach to ethics. Um, and I think of Anna Marta's paper, of course, on seniors and, and how, we, how we build that bridge or, or um, you know, universities obviously serve a role course, and Anna Marta's mentioned professional settings, as well as earlier in childhood, linking this problem of misinformation to um, ethical education as well. And so when we're talking about you know, the work that's coming out of this panel, are there ways to build that bridge to this, um, uh, I guess, Aristotelian approach of, of cultivating habits and the type of person who would recognize misinformation or seek truth? Yeah, um, <clears throat> great question. I mean, first of all, yes, we do have the one week interval showing that, you know, corrections outlast, or at least partially last at least that long. There's also some data out there on the inoculation. There was a recent paper in JEP General by Mertens et al. came out last year where they showed that inoculation can last up to a month, provided there are reminders uh, in the form of tests interspersed in, in that interval. And we're currently running a study where we're looking at going even further out, like three or four weeks to see if we can um, either maintain inoculation or insert little 30 second booster shots along the way to, to keep it up there. We don't have the data from that yet, but certainly within a month or so we will. And, and then I can answer that question with, with data. The general idea of bridging things sort of in the long term, um, well, there is some really great work done at Stanford by Sam Weinberg on uh, information literacy and teaching people information literacy. One of the uh, techniques that he is teaching high school students that's very effective is what's called lateral reading. And what that means is that if you're trying to assess the credibility of a website, you, you never look at the website itself. You open up other tabs and you go elsewhere and you search information about the website. That's what professional fact checkers do. And you can teach kids that in, you know, half an hour. And they instantly and lastingly get better at discerning the quality of a website. Uh, so there are techniques like that where I think you can sort of teach people something that lasts. In terms of political leaders and long lasting commitments to ethics, there, there is something called the pro-truth pledge that... Um, Gleb Tispersky. Thank you. I've forgotten his name. Who's yeah. uh, advocating that? And he's got some vaguely anecdotal, but not quite anecdotal data suggesting that works pretty well. Some politicians have signed up to that uh, in the United States, and there is some evidence that that makes a difference um, to, to their truthfulness afterwards. And the basic idea is very simple. It is that you, you sign a pledge saying, I will not forward anything without reading it. I will not believe everything I see. I'm going to be honest in what I say. I mean, fairly simple sort of pledges like that. And, and so, yeah, that's just a few of the sort of more long-term avenues I know of. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I guess the premise then is for me is I worry that in some ways we're putting a Band-Aid um, on things, which we have to right now. We're in the crisis in some ways. So rather than the long-term solutions, um, and the only way to get there, I think, is educating the person, right? And building character. That's harder to do and harder to measure. Um, but, you know, 
I think <laughs> the hard work is ahead of us, but I don't, I don't want us to forget that as well. Well, and of course, uh, dealing with the platforms. I mean, let's not become myopic. Uh, th this to me is a real, yeah, real right. problem because yeah. as psychologists, it's very tempting to say, oh, we just got to teach people to be better. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. But that's not the whole problem. The problem is that the landscape is formed by, you know, the incentives of the attention economy. And until we deal with that, and until we regulate the platforms, yeah. the psychology alone is never going to fix it. Well, I guess for me, it's how do we build in character formation, truth seeking into those platforms? I mean, that's a tough question. But to so that's also a form of education or a platform for education well, as well, not just... Um, so we can sort of move toward the common good on those platforms if we did build one that was um, public in orientation. One Eileen's point. One thing I think important to keep in mind here is that no matter how effective our individual education endeavors might be, uh, if what we're trying to do is inoculate people and the idea that they're individually going to resist all of this horrible disinformation and misinformation, no matter what the source, no, no matter what the topic coming at them forever, we're not going to be able to do it. We need to figure out some way to create a kind of a herd immunity here. And the one of the things that I've been thinking about in this vein is the fact that uh, values are not just individual, they're social. They're reinforced by the community of other people who share those values. And so we don't just get our information from our community, we get our values from our uh, community. And it seems to me that a lot of science deniers are locked in silos where they haven't met a scientist. And it's easy to distrust somebody that you haven't met. And I don't wanna put the blame for that on the scientists, though I have been proselytizing in uh, several published pieces to try to get scientists to reach out, to have business cards printed, to go to PTA meetings so that more and more people can actually uh, meet scientists, because I think that that will increase the, um, the community of concern, just, just the community, if you want to look at it that way, that science deniers have. It will, they'll get better information and it will increase trust. And I think that there's a sense in which it can be self-perpetuating. Because I think here of people who I already admire, scientists, who are individually extremely honest, yet the values of science require them to hold one another accountable, even if they're already honest, because <clears throat> even scientists have built in cognitive biases. And I'm not just talking here about scientific fraud, I'm talking about the example of scientists who just for whatever reason, given to the idea that you know they think that their study is right, even though the evidence doesn't quite show it yet, or they'll close the study when they get this uh, information that they want, or they'll keep it open until they uh, get the information they want. There, there are various ways short of fraud that scientists might, because they're human, cheat, to coin a phrase, uh, unless they knew, they knew that the values of science meant that their colleagues were going to look at their work and hold them accountable. So if, if we could figure out some way for uh, members of our society to, to look to the other people, a larger community of people to hold them accountable for what they believed, I think we would have a, a better chance with this. this. This is why, this is one reason that I've taken on this task of going to talk to science deniers face to face. Individually, I can't do much, but if I can convince scientists to join me and other people who care about science to join me, we can increase the exposure that science deniers have to a better audience of information and the right values. Yeah. One last small point is that I, I guess I'm, I'm not talking about forming individuals who will then, you know, to protect an individual against deception. I'm talking, I suppose, as a sociologist about creating a, at the level of culture yeah. and, and building a culture of ethics. I know that sounds sort of yeah. fluffy or whatever, but um, a it's a collective enterprise. And so how do we do that? Yeah. Monsignor? Yes, uh, we have a recent meeting about communication. So, uh, and uh, I propose, and I take this in the conclusion, uh, that we need to come back to the, the style of the discussion, medieval style, uh, that there are all our questions are, all our objections are. Our, so Thomas Aquinas uh, called this spirit of studiosity. 
we don't have and it's and it's a part of the virtue of the truth because for for our tradition the truth the communication of the truth the truth is not a virtue the truth as truth but the communication of the truth is a form of virtue because we need to choice the communicate the truth or not to communicate the truth and part of this virtue is the spirit of studiositas so understand the question and because they, they many many times we communicate information that we don't understand nothing and say this so i think uh, this is a, a form to put reflection and to put spirit critic spirit in, in in the things that we understand in the media and and to and to have a really and communication with virtue in the contrary <laughs> we we don't have virtue but we have just the contrary so uh, I think this is important. Spirit of studiosity. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess uh, other, other thoughts? This is time for the general discussion. Uh, picking up on, on this idea, I, I was always surprised by the first sentence of Aristotle's metaphysics, every man desires to know, and then you say, well, I, I'm not sure anyway, but the point is that this natural desire can be virtuous, and then you have the studiosities, or it can be vicious, and then you have what he calls curiosity, not in the, in the, in the good way, but, you know, people that uh, try to know things that don't matter or which are not their um, their matter you know uh, people who try to uh, do magic um, or to know what they don't uh, what, what, what's not relevant but then there is a a, a way of uh, developing our natural desire to know which is virtues and and i and that's part of the reason why education is so important and our uh, educational institutions are so important because uh, uh, before I mentioned um, our habit of uh, writing boring books, but it's not a joke. I think that part of our intellectual training has to do with being um, serious at a uh, the search for truth and and sometimes that's not very um, brilliant sometimes it's not very uh, publicly uh, um, relevant in, to a certain extent but it's important in order to build uh, a character in an, in order to yeah. build uh, an intellectual integrity and, and that, that's part of our mission as educators in, in higher institutions, I think, so. There, there's a, I, I'm sure you know, there's a, a field in uh, epistemology called virtue epistemology. So it is an analogy to virtue ethics. There's virtue epistemology uh, now, which is a small but, uh, but growing field, very interesting work uh, along these lines. Uh, but by the way, uh, so only a comment about this, this very important comment uh, for Thomas the spiritus of studiosity is just the, the virtue between two vices one is the curiositas <laughs> nothing only to superficial and the other is to not have any interest to nothing so I think this is really important Eileen you had a, a question comment uh, Eileen, can you hear? Oh, uh, you. I believe you're muted. We have a technical issue and we'll come back to you. I'm sorry. Um, do you, are you wearing headphones, Eileen? Um, uh, take, they said take off the headphones. I'm not sure why that might fix it. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, excellent. Okay. 
Yeah, it's just a comment on the, the previous comment about scientists going in and talking to people and talking to people who are perhaps skeptical. And I think that's hugely important because the whole process of science I think, is quite, the way it's often spoken about is often very ideal and it needs to be demystified for the public. And I think part of that is that perhaps as researchers, we're not entirely honest with what we do. Not everything fulfills great enlightenment ideals of objectivity and truth seeking. A lot of work that's done in universities is no different to any other type of career where people are motivated by status or the need to get ahead or the need to publish a paper before that review comes up at the end of the year. And that leads to not outright fraud. You know, we shouldn't pretend that every single piece of scientific work or everything that's published is some um, amazing piece of objective work. Being more honest about that, I think, and maybe a fear of being honest about that is that it might make people trust science. I think it's quite the opposite. It would take things down from a pedestal and help people see that actually these are normal processes. There are disagreements, and those disagreements are resolved through structured processes. If we maintain the pretense that science and what scientists do in universities is some kind of, um, I don't want to say mystical, because that's the inappropriate word, but that it's somehow on a pedestal, then I think it's much harder for people to trust in what it is. Um, so I think your point about just talking to people and actually normalizing who scientists are and what scientists do is a, an important way forward. Okay. Thank you. The, there's um, so, some researchers have called this degrees of freedom. I think that people have in uh, in research, and it seems to me Im important that um, if people if people understood that, and if scientists had more to say about that, they would actually rise in how trustworthy they were. Because otherwise, people will. Uh, it, this goes to the flick point number five, doesn't it? Um, that they think that science has to be perfect, and that when they find out it's not, then they distrust it and give up rather than uh, uh, you know hearing what it's really like. See. Yeah, <clears throat> on the issue of uh, scientists going out and talking to people, of course, you know, I'm, I'm totally in favor of that. I do it all the time. Um, the, the only consideration I want to offer in that context is that you've got to sort, you, you got you to work out where your time is best spent. Now, if I only have 100 hours a year, let's say, to communicate to people, then there isn't much to be gained if I spend 99 of those 100 hours talking to one hardcore science denier and maybe I chip away at their motivated cognition by a little bit. But in the end, nothing happens. Whereas if I spend 99 or even the full 100 hours talking to people who are actually open-minded or sympathetic to science, uh, if I preach to the choir to back them up against science denial, I would argue you can achieve a hell of a lot more. So this idea of going out and talking to science deniers is something that I'm very ambivalent about for that reason, not because it's inherently bad or because we shouldn't, but because, you know, it's like in terms of, you know, bang for the buck, what are you going to get if you, if you could talk to flat earthers? Aren't you better off talking to high school kids for the same amount of time who then get excited about science? So that's my only, it's a purely pragmatic right. question I have about the wisdom of that. I have a really quick follow-up. And also, if the scientists don't look like the people they're talking with, it's often quite alienating and they don't understand the cultural context. The same with journalists, with waning trust in journalism. One of the approaches is, oh, we should have the journalists go into the communities, explain the reporting process, explain how the sausage is made. But if the journalists never look like you or talk like you or understand your background, it can actually be more alienating. Yeah. Uh, uh, Monsignor, I'll, I'll let you decide between the two of you who goes. Well, in, in the papers of this morning, uh, raised to me the following consideration. Um, from an institutional and social point of view, what is the main problem with the issue of truth, with the issue of uh, knowledge? It's what we were saying. It is the fact that the nature of truth as well as the nature of knowledge is that of a common, common good. It is neither a private good nor a public good. That, in my opinion, is the major reasons why even the academics keep on uh, talking without understanding each other. 
because uh, certain people treat uh, knowledge as if it were a private good and they apply the usual market rules as we do with a normal private good. Other people, they say, no, it's a public good. And so they attribute to government, by government we can mean an authority above the market. It seems to me that that is not true because the very nature of truth is that of a common good. Now, there is an analogy in this regard. You remember Garrett Hartin in 1968, the tragedy of commons. He was a biologist, very, he became famous because uh, with ref specific reference to the environmental problem, he said, why are we destroying our environment, uh, water, hair, et cetera? Because environment is a common good and uh, politicians, economists, sociologists, et cetera, social science, they insist in treating it either as a private good or as a public good. And so the result is that we do not yet today have a governance rules for dealing with common goods. That does not exist. Those who claim the opposite are liars because we do not even have one model of uh, solving the, the following question, answering for how to treat a common good from an institutional point of view, because you cannot apply, apply the usual market rules, nor the usual command rules, which are typical of a, a, of a government, et cetera. So it is obvious that a common good re relies on reciprocity. That is the basic principle. If we want to find a governance structure for a common good, we have to find a way of reciprocity, which is known as a concept, but we still are lagging behind in finding viable models of reciprocity. That is a point which some way we should stress. Otherwise, we will keep on complaining about what is going on, et cetera, et cetera, but the, the men in the street will ask us, what do you propose in concrete terms in order to cope? Thank you. Martini? I think that the, the, the speech of the president was very important. And I, I, I asked me and you, you we, have, we have many human rights, but not have a human right to the truth. The first human right that we need to, to have and to defend and to propose and to be obliged to do is the, the truth. <laughs> because in the country, we don't have society. If we not are able, uh, I say the, the same that you say, we don't have democracy. If we do not able to communicate the truth, the virtue of truth, the communication is a virtue of truth, we not have society. It's clear because what is the meaning of the locution? Is to communicate the truth. So if we don't have truth, we have other things. This is uh, a comment of the things that say oppression. But my question is, it's not deny the science because they don't know science. This is the problem, not know science. Maybe know a falsification of science made by the journalists but not science. Look, as I say, in the conclusion that we have in the meeting with 25 Nobel Prize in sciences are completely different of the media say about science. In the great question, creation, the origin of man, uh, the, this, the man that has a soul. So all the more important anthropological and theological questions, science is in favor. Science can have a good relation with this humanistic approach. But the question is that the journalists say other things that is not science. They deny, for example, the question of evolution. The question of evolution, that we are the mythology that we have today, that we are the, the last moment of the evolution of the chaos in the matter and we are matter more complicated than the other. This is not science. This is a, a fantastic in the invention of journalists. 
but not say Darwin, don't say any one of the more important uh, theory of the evolution. So I think this is important. They don't know, don't know, really. So. Thank you. Um, uh, the, I entirely agree with Justin that education here is the, 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 the most fundamental uh, point of departure for moving forward. On the question of, of scientists, on the question of scientists and their um, connection with and their engagement with um, the, uh, the, the practices of science, there are two beautiful examples, and uh, Sima knows uh, these are two, it's an N of two, so you, we can't generalize, but they're so powerful and so beautiful. Um, two very eminent physicists in their last chapters, uh, Georges Charpak, who won the Nobel Prize in physics, uh, survivor of uh, the Nazis, uh, they cut his finger, the former head of CERN in, in Switzerland, and Leo Letterman, he just passed, the head of the Fermi lab in Chicago. At the, in the last chapter, um, Letterman created the Illinois Math and Science Academy. Uh, Jacques Pack had a, a school in Paris. He, he gave us a magnificent tour, uh, where the, mostly the children of immigrants and the children of uh, immigrants into France. Uh, and their point of entry was the way science is being taught today is catastrophic, whether it's in Paris or in Chicago. Uh, this is how not to teach science. Uh, and their engagement with children in Chicago, mostly minority children, African-American and uh, Hispanic ch origin children, and in Paris, mostly uh, immigrants from, from North Africa, is a beautiful testament to scientists who are not into, Eileen, I think you called it the, the entire project of mystification of science precisely the anti-project, the project of all of us can do science. And it's our obligation, it's our duty, as I think Monsignor said, maybe one of the first rights, to have the tools to be able to uh, become autonomous thinkers and autonomous scientists. Yeah, I I sort of have a comment, but also a question, I guess, to Seema and, and Max, I suppose, as well, and myself, because you and I include myself in that, we we have all said that the deficit model of science communication is wrong. Uh, a lot of people say that, sort of common wisdom. People don't need facts. You have to somehow do something else. Um, and I accept that from experience. Um, I know that people are not always receptive to facts. And yet, at the same time, we're all talking about educating children and teaching them stuff and we've been talking about education being the solution. Yesterday, Jess Sachs was telling us how important education is and that it works because it, you know, raises vaccine uptake. So I guess my question is, how do we reconcile these sort of vaguely opposing truths? To me, they are somewhat paradoxical. So what's your resolution? So I don't think we're saying the knowledge deficit model is wrong. I think okay. we're saying it has deficiencies and yet we just keep okay. repeating it, expecting some good results. And I don't think we're saying facts are not what we need. We're saying facts alone are insufficient. And that given what we know about belief being as much about, or what we believe being as much about tribalism and 
my I believed in conspiracy theories as a kid because people around me did and it was a sense of belonging and it made us different to the establishment given what we know there we just keep repeating this knowledge deficit model thinking somehow it's going to permeate these biases and I think in public health especially sidelining the power of narrative so I think it takes a combination of these and also what we do in public health over and over is a one-size-fits-all message for everybody yeah even though we know there are publics and not age public. So I think those are some of the things we need to integrate. Okay. The, the, uh, in it, the anecdotal accounts that I've read of um, hardcore science deniers who change their mind, it always happens in the same way. They are always approached by someone who they either already trust or they grow to trust, who treats them with respect, who listens, who's empathetic. And once trust is built, then they share facts, or, or rather they ask questions that will lead the person to the facts. And there are uh, just shocking examples of uh, success with this, with this model. Uh, and I, I wish I had, I wish I knew of an empirical study, which uh, uh, talked about this because so far all I've seen are anecdotal accounts but I've seen many, many, many anecdotal accounts, which, which are the, the same thing. So I, I like the way that you put it. It's, it's that facts are uh, insufficient alone, but when approached in the right way, they, then they can, uh, they can help. I do agree. I think you put it well. I, in my afternoon comments, I planned to quote Suzanne Mosier who, talked, who talks about how providing information and filling knowledge gaps is at best necessary, but rarely sufficient to create the kind of active behavioral engagement that we're looking for. And so the sustained engagement as well. And so, you know, I also plan to quote Brian Wynn, but just in the conversation here, he talks about the deficit model is dead, but long live the deficit model. And that's to say that we revert to education. We revert to these places of science as a legitimate uh, arena for us to feel as though we have authority uh, and insight, but there must be more. And so we need those expanded pathways to honor our experiential ways of knowing, to honor our um, visceral, emotional ways of engagement. So it's just a way to elaborate, I guess, on essentially what's been said. And, and um, Lee, you had said yesterday morning, which I thought was resonant for me as well, it's not a deficit of information necessarily, but a deficit of truth. And so education is an important component of that. However, we need to be doing much more. Yeah, I think this is really interesting. I think that's an excellent point, Stephen. But, um, but because as persons, you know, we, we internalize information and we rely on it to act in the world, right? But it's again, much more than that, because it's about who, who we are, in a sense, um, and the types of persons that we as society are creating, right? And which includes information and to, to Seema's point is about the epistemic communities of which we are a part. And that starts at an early age, obviously. And, and I think, again, begins with education and ends with it as well, I think. Mm -hmm. can, can I say something? Uh, in the past, we, we say only the truth has rights. And this was is a little abstract, but maybe today we can articulate this in a in a first in a form of pers personal form to say each person uh, need to have uh, have right to, to 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 know the truth and to defend the truth and and also to the the right to say the truth. The, the, the death to, to say the truth, the duty to say the truth. So some, some kind of this, because I think <laughs> the truth is the more important thing and we don't, we don't speak more. Maybe in the past was an exaggeration because it was some abstract, the principle, only truth have rights. But today we need to articulate this in a more anthropological way. Thank you. I have one more thought on the education piece, if there's a, a, a moment. Can't, oh, I, I'm sorry, somebody else. Eileen, please. I was just, just going to say very quickly that uh, we can't think of truth, in particular when we're talking about scientific topics that impact how people live. We can't talk about truth in complete isolation from ideas about justice 
and fairness. And based on some of the things you were mentioning earlier, I was thinking of conservation science, which across the world has been hugely controversial because it involves telling people, often poor people who have been denied opportunities, that the practices that they and their communities have practiced for hundreds of years, if not longer, are no longer suitable because a bunch of scientists somewhere have said. And there tends to be massive resistance, understandably. And those types of conflicts are rarely resolved. And what happens is we have you know, the paper parks where we say conservation is happening, but it isn't really. And I think a lot of those conflicts come back from a great sense of injustice, where the people who are being asked to change their behaviors do not see that they're benefiting or that they are being supported properly. And that leads to great resentment of science and the idea that these elite people come in and tell them what they can and can't do. So that was just in terms of what you were saying about science communication and how we uh, relate to people. And, and yet some of the people who suffer the most from the um, sorts of problems that we've been talking about are the poor. I think of Flint, the Flint water crisis. Who had more interest in the truth than the people who lived in Flint, Michigan? Um, the, the point I wanted to make about education was that, um, and I, I can't remember whether I already said something about this yesterday, so I'll keep it brief. The um, science education, I think, should uh, educate about the values of science, about how science is done, not just the results of science. So it seems to me, uh, the, the question of uncertainty uh, comes up um, a, a lot among scientists, but they don't talk about it very much in public. And, and I think, Simi, you had said, you get on CNN and you just wanna say, just listen to us. But you, you know, amongst yourselves, you talk about the error bars and confidence intervals and what you know and what you don't know. And I'm, I'm a great advocate that scientists need to embrace the idea of uncertainty and that we need to teach that as part of science education from an early age. If fourth and fifth graders were conducting experiments and failing and understanding uncertainty and seeing what they knew and what they didn't and actually seeing what it felt like to be a scientist and not just reading about the results that you know somebody had come up with 100 years ago, I think they would have more uh, uh, better understanding and also internalize the values of science uh, when they got older. Yeah. I think it's really interesting though in, um, Stephen will probably remember the details of this research better than me, but in Germany there were, um, there was a, a, uh, an epidemiologist who had a, a weekly podcast that became extremely popular. And the research afterwards shows now that the understanding of the scientific method and the understanding of certainty and the understanding of results building on each other um, is now much greater among the German population. I think it's even spread to Denmark a little bit. And I think part of it is the huge publication bias that we have where our journals only report positive results and it's really hard to get um, null results or negative results published. It's beginning to change a little bit with open science practices, but I think the whole thing about open science, um, maybe even pre-registering. So if you can pre-register your hypotheses and then report whether your results are positive, negative or null, um, would start to open this up a lot. So, you know, I think the main thing is for kids to understand the method to understand that there, there are negative and null results, and there is important. In fact, sometimes they're more important than the positive results. And, you know, it's really hard for us to find those. So I think if we could find somewhere in our conclusions to kind of stress about open science, it might be very useful. I think his name is Christian Drosten. I called him the German Fauci. That's it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jesus. I have several thoughts. Um, one was that, Stephen, you said that was a question for yourself, too. I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Um, another is just that when we think about kids, I mean, oftentimes with a few teenagers myself, I've, I've been, I've said, you know, those people are behaving like kids and they remind me, well, kids don't behave like that. <laughs> um, and and you had mentioned having young people to the Vatican and speaking with clarity and uh, we have a lot to teach each other. And so I think to the extent that we look to education, we risk uh, looking past the fact that we need to 
to work with one another much more as adults to understand, for instance, the intricacies of uncertainty. There are all kinds of uncertainties around precision. And there's also uncertainty around the unknown unknowns, if you will. And so the more that we can start to think more critically about different dimensions of uncertainty can help us get into complex problems as adults and with the clarity of young people that can help us on that pathway. So that's just part of the swirling um, way in which I, I hear education and I, I'm all in favor of it, but I also just want us to proceed with caution and that we're lifelong learners, all of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. About one minute left. Justin, do you want to take that minute for yourself? No, no I think, were you going to answer, oh, Max? Yeah. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, well, <laughs> Uh, I mean, my resolution is similar to yours, Seema. I mean, I think, you know, the deficit model obviously can't be wrong because otherwise, <laughs> you know, you would never learn anything, right? I mean, it's just silly to say the deficit model is, is I mean, you know. Um, ha having said that, what I think is crucial is number one, the match between the audience and the messenger. And I think you made that point as well. You have to differentiate between different publics. There is clear evidence uh, in the vaccination area. Dan Cahan published a paper on this with the HPV vaccine that matching, you know, that one, 2010, it came out where he's matching messenger to the audience and finds that whenever that happens, he can dramatically shift people's attitudes. But if the messenger is not matched to the audience, so if you have a you know, a Republican talk to the hippies or a hippie talks to Republicans, then all hell breaks loose. And, you know, no one changes their mind. So that's, um, that's, that's totally... why I don't go on Fox News. Right. Say, you should go on Fox News to break that bubble. No. Exactly. No one on Fox News is listening to me. <laughs> exactly. No, you're absolutely right. Um, so anyway, that would be my answer to, to at, a, at a reconciliation that uh, facts alone won't do the trick, but by the time you add the right messenger and the messages that are culturally consonant, you know, uh, reframing climate change as a national security issue to reach conservative audiences, emphasizing the co-benefits of climate mitigation because people live longer if we cut emissions. You know, there, there's all sorts of, well, I'm sure you'll talk about, it. I don't want to <laughs> steal your thunder, but it's probably one of the things you'll talk about this afternoon. So. Sure. Thank you. I think we go to lunch.